He had no appetite, he did not want to eat or drink, and undoubtedly that was on account of the inward turmoil which this man was going through. You see, he was having to face something utterly terrible. He was having to face the reality that everything in his life was wrong. Here he was, this great man of God, this man of the law, this Pharisee, this religious man, and he was having to discover that his zeal for the law was worthless, and his religious opinions were all wrong, and his zeal for God was all wrong. And you see, God was humbling this man. And after three days, Ananias came to him with this message of the forgiveness of sins. And he urges him, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And this man who has come from Jerusalem in order to exterminate the name of Jesus Christ from the face of the earth, he humbly goes to baptism, to be baptized in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And then this same man, days later, he is found in the synagogues preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. What a humbling thing for this man. His pride has been destroyed. He has been utterly brought down in order that he might be built up again in Jesus Christ. Now you see, Paul's problem, of course, was the same problem that most of the Jews of his day had. He describes it in Romans 10, verses 1 to 3. When he's speaking about the Jews, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. In other words, these Jews, including Paul in his early days, they believed that they could be righteous by keeping the law. And Paul certainly believed that God was satisfied with his personal righteousness. Now Jesus himself tells us that he was not satisfied. Verse 20 of this Sermon on the Mount, I, of chapter 5 in this sermon, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus goes on to show that God's standard of righteousness is far higher than we like to imagine. Far higher than Paul himself imagined in his days as a Pharisee. Jesus shows that anger and verbal abuse and contempt for our fellow man, these are nothing but the sin of murder in embryo. They are the same thing in a lesser stage of development. The lustful look Jesus shows that the lustful look is the consequence of adultery in the heart. And when you read through verses 17 to 48 of this chapter, all this 
exposition of God's standards, what conclusion do you draw when you come to the end? There is only one conclusion for each of us to draw. According to Jesus, I am a murderer. According to Jesus, I am an adulterer. According to Jesus, I am a liar. According to Jesus, I am a self-centered person. I do not love my neighbor as God requires. And I'm under God's righteous condemnation. And I can never, by my own efforts, put myself right with God. What Jesus is telling us is that the happy person is the person who has faced this truth. The person who has come face to face with God's standards, who has acknowledged his utter failure, his failure in the past, his present failure, who has acknowledged that he has no hope by himself of meeting these standards in the future, and he has come to the point where he despairs of his own righteousness and he is willing to become a beggar, holding out an empty hand to receive mercy and grace from God. We're going to sing the words in our final hymn, Nothing in my hand I bring, we're not going to sing it yet, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Saviour, or I die. Not the labours of my hands can fulfil my lo thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Christ must save, and Christ alone. Now you see, these words are the language of a beggar. Naked I come to you for dress. Helpless I look to you for grace. Filthy, foul, I come to the fountain. Wash me, Saviour, or I die. Jesus gives another illustration in Luke chapter 18, in verses 9 to 14, where we have the story, the parable, of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee, in his own estimation, is spiritually rich. He prays, verse 11, O God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. No, O God, I am not like that. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector is a beggar in spirit. He has come to an end of himself. He is crying out to God for mercy. And Jesus tells us that he went home right with God. So you see, the first aspect of being a spiritual beggar is that uh, the person has come to face the reality of his sin. And the second is that he has been made willing to be justified freely by the grace and the mercy of God. It must be a terrible thing to beg. 
maybe it's different for those who've grown up on the streets and never known anything else. But imagine for a moment someone who has been self-sufficient, someone who has been self-supporting, and yet they have lost everything, and finally they make this decision, the only thing I can do is to go out onto the street and to stand and to beg. What a terrible decision that would be. How utterly humbling. You would have to be truly desperate, would you not, to make that decision. Jesus is telling us that spiritually that is the position we must come to. We must come to the point where we recognize that there is absolutely nothing that I have ever done, nothing that I can ever do that can secure my peace with God. And I become willing to go to God and to confess that and to accept the gift of salvation and eternal life absolutely freely as the gift of God. Listen again to Paul's experience that he uh, describes in, uh, Galatia, in um, Philippians chapter 3. In verses 4 to 6, he tells us the things that he once had confidence in and that he uh, could boast about. He says, I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, in other words, the external outward obedience to the Ten Commandments, blameless. Paul is telling us what he could and used to boast about. Now listen to how he's come to view it. He says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see what he's saying? He's saying that he has looked at all the things that he once boasted about, all the things which other people, other Jews are still boasting about. And he says, I have lost them all. I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I count them as rubbish. You know our modern translations are very delicate and very polite in the way they translate this. The authorized version translates it correctly. He says, I count it dung. The word that is used, according to the Greek lexicons, it means human excrement. That is what Paul says. I count it dung. I utterly reject it for the sake of knowing Christ my Lord. Well, that was Paul's experience. What